Hello and welcome to this, my video on tree diagrams, part of the Year 9 Probability course. My name is Darren from Mascuri. Thank you very much for joining. If you haven't already done so, can you subscribe? It just shows me that someone is watching out there. So subscribe to me on YouTube, of course. Clicking that little button is such a little effort from you, hopefully, but it actually means a massive amount to me. And obviously there is mathsguru.com where you sign up for absolutely free. There's all these videos, downloaded notes for your summary books, there's time codes, there's exam questions and all sorts of stuff. So let's get started, shall we? What are we looking at today? Well, I understand what a tree diagram is. This may be the first time you've ever met a tree diagram. Maybe old knowledge. Understand that a tree diagram is used to list the sample space for experiments with two or more steps, know how to construct a tree diagram, and know how to use a tree diagram to calculate probabilities. All right, that seems fairly straightforward. Why do I do this at the start of the video? Because it's always good to know where we're going, yeah? And then by the end, we know, oh, did I understand all that? Hopefully. Now, in a previous videos, we have gone through, what have we gone through? Basic probabilities, Venn diagrams, um, two-way tables. We've got uh, arrays or tables to show multi-stage or two-step experiments. Oof. There's a lot of learning. If you haven't watched those, they are again on MathsGuru. And again, you can download the notes for this video. Why not actually head over to MathsGuru now? Download the notes, exactly what's behind me, and then you can write all over them for the stuff that maybe I don't write. Now, we said previously to find the probability of something, we find that the PR, and in brackets, we write whatever the event is, say even or odd or greater than three. And then generally speaking, we've got some sort of numerical answer, maybe a fraction, maybe a decimal, maybe a percentage. And that's really defined by how the question has given you. But eventually, or um, if we look at it as some sort of a fraction, we have a number on top of a number. Now this one here is the total number of outcomes and this here is the number of outcomes for a success or for whatever we're looking at for sort of even numbers, the number of even numbers divided by how many numbers there were in total. That comes in really, really useful later. But what if we want to show a different way of all of the different outcomes? In the previous video, we looked at, what did we look, two-step experiments, we looked at tables or an array. And exactly there. So if we had two coins, we could actually show it pictorially uh, like this, where again, we had our first throw was our columns. We had our second throw, which was our rows. And we said, well, for each throw, the outcomes could be head or tail. Likewise, for that, uh, for the rows there, head and tail as well. And then things in brackets basically were in order, the things that happened. So H comma H said the first throw was a head the second throw was ahead, right? This is great, we love it. Thank you very much, shows all the information, but is there another way of doing it? Well, I should cocoa, there is a tree diagram. Now the basics of a tree diagram are, there is also always a start, all right? Now I always draw a dot as a start, and there are branches which come off of this, and the branches are basically the outcomes of an experiment or, or the, the individual numbers. So let's go with a coin for the moment. How many different sort of, outcomes are there. What's the sample space of a coin? It's head and tail. So in this situation, we know that a coin could be heads or tails. So I'm going to write head there or tail. Now I tend to draw a dotted line. That's just for me. So I know that here, that would be my first toss of my coin. All right. Then what would happen if I tossed a coin again? Well, as it turns out, say I got a head on the first one. Yes. Yeah? So that new dot that I've just done. All right is basically where I've ended up. I've thrown the first head. Does my coin now lose a side? No, it doesn't. All right, toss that coin once and down, and I'm gonna toss it again. It still has the same number of outcomes that are possible, or possible outcomes, head and tail. So what I drew on now, again, is another two branches off to show that again, there is a head and there is a tail. But what if I got a tail? Would the outcomes of the coin change? No they still would have a head and tail on the next one. So there we go. So we'd have a head coming off here and we have a tail coming off there. And notice what I've done. I've drawn my tree diagram. Now again, I would draw a dotted line and if it were up to me, then I would be like, oh, what if I threw it a third time? Well, do you see a potential problem of trying to draw this a third time? We're going to run out of space, yes? And trying to draw these things well can become really, really hard if you do it from front to back. But if I were to do it back to front, that might actually be awesome because I'm never going to be able to run out of space. How are we going to do that? More on that in a moment. So let's just go down. Tree diagrams always come from a start point. I've got that. Tick. They have branches which stand for the possible events, right? So the head and the tail for a coin, 
we've got there. The probabilities for each collection of branches from a point will always add to one. And you're going to say, well, what do you mean by that? Hold on. The list of probabilities at the end of the branches will always add to one. A tree diagram can be used to show all possible outcomes. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to say, let's write down the probabilities on my tree diagram as well. And then you're going to say, huh? So what is the probability for a standard coin of getting a head? Well, hopefully it's a half. So I tend to write there in a different color, a half. What about the tail? Exactly the same, it's a half. That head still is gonna be a half, that tail is gonna be a half, the head is gonna be a half, and that tail is gonna half. Now, what I'm saying is for this second dot point or the third dot point, the one I'm now ticking, the probabilities for each collection of branches from a point will add to one. If I take each set of branches, each sort of um, diversion off of a point, what I notice is they always add to one. Why? Because all of the probabilities are there. So I've got this, if I look at this branch here, I've got a half plus a half, which gives me one. Now, obviously, if I go back to the dot I'm now drawing in blue, and look at my branch coming off that I'm drawing in blue, those branches will always add to one because I've got a head and a tail. Now this is useful later on in an exam if I was to give you a blank one of these, or in fact I filled in just some of the numbers because you'd be able to find the other ones. The list of probabilities at the end of the branches will always add to one. I'll come back to that in a moment. The tree diagram can be used to show all possible outcomes. Right, well if I'm starting at the start and I'm going along this top branch here, that means I've got a head followed by a head. Oh, okay then. If I start and go along the head and then diverge down to the tail, that one there says I've had a head followed by a tail. This one here, tail followed by a head. And this one here and here is going to be a tail followed by a tail. And there we go. The ends of those branches, if you notice, are all the outcomes that we've had before. Yes, if we go back, what do we have? Head, 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 tail, uh, tail head and tail tail. I need to change that one again, but there we go. So what do I have? I've got all my possible outcomes. How do I work out the probabilities of each of these? Well, as you go along a particular path, if you want to call it, so I've got a head followed by a head, I take the probabilities and I multiply them together. So a half times a half is a quarter. And in fact, all of these will be a half times a half, which is a quarter. A half times a half is a quarter. And a half times a half is a quarter. Now what I'm saying by this fourth point is the list of probabilities at the end of the branches will always add to one. If we look and take this, and that one, and that one, and that one, if we take the quarter plus the quarter plus the quarter plus the quarter, what do we notice? It's going to add to one. Again, that should make sense because, yeah, all of those outcomes are exhaustive. That's the only ones we can get when we throw two coins. And so it would suggest that all of those individual probabilities must add to one because one means certain. It is certain we are going to have one of those four or all of those four when we add them together. So that's a tree diagram. Love, 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 love. Now I said a moment ago we can try and draw these things backwards. So let's go back. Say so how many outcomes were there when we had two throws of a standard coin? So when we had two throws of a standard coin, we had, there was my first throw, there was my second throw, one, two, three, four. There were four outcomes there, right? Two throws of a standard coin. How many outcomes will it be with three throws? Well, each of those is gonna have another two coming off of it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many throws will be there for? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. See, it becomes really, really challenging, doesn't it? I've already run out of space on just that small diagram. But if we go back to say how many were there for just a standard coin, it was two. So what we seem to be doing is we're going two times two gave me the four. Two times two times two gave me eight. Two times two times two times two gave me the 16. So where did we get these two from? Well, they were the number of outcomes, right? So a head and a tail. And obviously every one of these is an event. So because I did it four times, I do two times two times two times two, four, and that gives me 16. So how is that now gonna help me? Well, if for example, I wanted to do 16 events, rubbing out this one here to try and show you why. 
What I would now do is I would do 16 dots. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now, because I know that each of those dots can be paired up because a coin has two outcomes, I'd go pair those, pair those, pair those, pair those, pair those, pair those. Now, again, I'm going to run out of room because, but what do we now notice? Well, two of those are going to join together to give me another one. So those two are going to join, those two are going to join, those two are going to join, and those two are going to join. And then they're going to join and they're going to join and they're going to join now again that there would be the coin tosses of four all right and again not a particularly nice diagram but hopefully you get the general idea i'm fairly limited with space here guys come on give me a break yes but can that help us later on with other questions hopefully Right, let's look at some examples. There's two examples. An experiment involves tossing two coins. Complete a tree diagram to show all possible outcomes. Well, surprisingly, I've already done this. There's one, two, three, four. So we're going to join those together, and join those together, and then join those together, and those together. So I've got head, followed by tail, head, tail, head, and tail. Complete a tree diagram to show all the possible outcomes. Now in that situation, I'm just going to write down at the end my outcomes. Head, 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 tail, tail, head, and tail, tail. Now some people love drawing these things much more so than doing other sort of sorts of maths. That's okay, it's not a huge problem. Right, what is the total number of outcomes? So in which case the total number of outcomes would be four. ka -ching. Right, and find the probability of tossing two tails. Now this is where I look down and I go, well, okay. How many of these have two tails? And as it turns out, only one of them. So my probability of two tails is going to be equal to, what have we got? One out of four. One of them has two tails and there were four outcomes in total. That's why we always look for those four outcomes. One tail. Ah, now one tail. How many of these have just one tail? Well, I'm going to put a circle around that one. That's got one tail and a circle around that one. Right, not two tails, right, because it wants one tail. So let me see what's going to be two on four, which hopefully you're going to be happy to cancel down to one half. And we always must cancel down at least one head. Now, at least one head means it's got to have one head or two heads. Oh, OK, then. So what shape can I do here? Let's do a triangle. That's got a head, just one head in it. That's got one head in it and that's got two heads in it. So the probability at least one head all right so greater than or equal to is the same is three on four now there is another way of doing this and that's using the idea of complements and later on in sort of uh, later on in in different areas of the course particularly in years 10 11 and 12 we find it easier to work out the probability that there are no heads and then take it away from one yes because if there's one at least one head then pretty much everything except for two tails is going to have one head. So in that situation, we could have done the probability of greater than or equal to one head is equal to one minus the probability of two tails, which gives me one minus, what's the probability of two tails? A quarter and one minus a quarter gave me three quarters. Now, if you didn't understand that, don't worry about it. It's all good. We'll come back to that at another time. Two people are selected at random without replacement. Now, again, if you've watched my previous video, you'll know that without replacement means that they don't get recounted. Once they're gone, they're gone, and we can't reuse them. Now, that changes my tree diagram a little bit. Uh, from a group of three people, Annabelle, Brody, and Chris, you list all the possible outcomes for the selection using a tree diagram. So in this situation, I'm not going to go backwards because I don't know how, or do I? So there's Annabelle. There's Brody, and there is Chris. So my first selection of person actually means I can select any one of those three. But, yes, two people are selected. So I've done this as my first person. I now want to do a second person. So I've got to the end of here. Annabelle's already been chosen. So who have I got left? Because she's not going back in the mix. Yep, it's just Brody and Chris. So that's Brody and Chris. 
When I get to the end of Brody as a choice, Brody is no longer available, so that would give me Annabelle or Chris. And when we get to the end of Chris, that would tell me that the only two people would be Annabelle or Brody. So if I now do, I always do dots at the end, I don't know why. It's a bit of a time waster, really. A bit like coloring in. So list all the possible outcomes using a tree diagram. There'd be A, B, A, C, B, A, B, C, C, A, and C, B. And there we go. They are all my possible outcomes. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six different outcomes. I'm going to write six over here just in case they ask me any questions. Oh, here we go. Find the probabilities that the selection will contain Annabelle and Brody. Right, so we want the probability of Annabelle and Brody. Now again, order here isn't important. It doesn't say Annabelle first and then Brody. It's just Annabelle and Brody because I'm not even sure order here was important anyway. So let's see how many of those have A, B. One, two, because I've got A, B and B, A. So that's going to be two on six, which we would remember to cancel down to one on three. Find the probabilities of the selections will contain Chris. So the probability that Chris will be in. So how many of them have a C in? One, two, three, four. So four out of six, which would give me two thirds, right? Four of those selections have Chris out of the six in total. Brody or Chris. Oh, more interesting. So we want Brody or Chris. So that has a Brody in, that has a Chris in, that has a Brody. That has a Brody, that has a Chris, and that has a Chris. Hold on a moment, that's all of them. Aha! So in which case, that would be either six on six, or we could just write it down as one, which is certain every single one of those would have to. Now, tree diagrams are incredibly powerful, and later on when we start working out probabilities from them and what have you, they are freaking awesome. But hopefully that's giving you a taster on what it is you need to know. But Let's call it a day for this video. Thanks very much for watching. Hopefully it's been useful. Subscribe to YouTube if you can, please. It just lets me know that you're watching. Sign up to Masguru where all the goodness is. And hopefully I'll see you in another video. If not, please take care and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.